Hello, back again. So I'm getting used to it at the stage, um, although it's my f first time here. So um, how would everybody like to uh, get finance or finance to be more uh, consumer easy? Wouldn't that be awesome? Um, because of companies like Credit Karma, sometimes I wish I could live in a more technology-driven and more digitalized country, for example, like US. Maybe that's sometime, that will happen someday. Um, me and the founder, we have a, a common thing, uh, maybe all of us have, after, for example, after a long day of hustle and working, I like to recharge and <clears throat> de de deconnect from everything else that happened that day. Um, so this is one thing that we like to do, is play games at the end of the, ga at the, end of the day. So. Uh, please welcome uh, Kenneth Lin and John Rampton uh, with a big, big, big round of applause. How's it going, everybody? You guys having a good conference? Oh, come on, you guys. We stand up sometimes for these things. Are you guys having fun? <laughs> yeah! All right. Well, let's... Uh, Let's jump straight into this. Uh, Ken, tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, sh uh, sure, so Ken Lin, founder CEO of Credit Karma. Uh, I think uh, I moved to the States when I was uh, four years old, grew up in Las Vegas, uh, started uh, Credit Karma 10 years ago, and somehow here I am. Nice, nice. Uh, now, Credit Karma is part of this infamous billion dollar club, correct? <laughs> I guess so, yeah. We've, uh, we've made unicorn status, for whatever that's worth. How, how does that feel? Who wants to be a unicorn? There's only three <laughs> people in the audience. Come on, you guys. Not very popular, Yeah, not very popular. Apparently, nobody wants to be here at a startup conference. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know if, any, I don't know if uh, starting off a goal of being a unicorn is the right thing to do, right? I think that you should have uh, a vision, a mission of what you want to build. And I think if that becomes ultimately successful from a financial perspective, you know, the, the unicorn club or, or being a billion dollar valuation is, is, I guess, a good metric of that. But I think it's hard to build businesses strictly on a, a function of trying to hit a billion dollar valuation, right? I think you should really be trying to solve consumer problems. I think a lot of people move away from that. They don't realize, like, the, the end goal is not the valuation, but really solving a problem. I think you're much more successful if you make that your objective rather than focusing on necessarily revenues or necessarily focusing on an ultimate valuation. Yeah, so tell me about the early days. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs here in the audience are you know, starting out, starting new companies. Tell us, it wasn't always sexy. Right now you're like this sexy startup worth a lot of money. Tell us about the non-sexy days. Yeah, yeah. So, so Credit Karma started in 2007. We got about four people, put basically every penny that I had in my, in my bank, got a little bit of an angel investment, and we put our head down and started Credit Karma in 2007. We launched a product in 2008 after a year of working pretty much tirelessly through you know, the ups and downs of integration, through all the hard work of getting partners on board. And um, you know, we, we had a good product. I think there's two particularly interesting war stories, I, I think, associated with starting Credit Karma. Um, you know, one was basically um, starting the product, being really successful. Uh, so you know, we, we launched a product, got a lot of great press. Uh, and at the same time, you know, our, our partners weren't exactly sure what we were doing. We got like a termination notice almost. Yeah. you know, uh, two, three weeks into launch, right? So there's a, a panic moment. We worked through that. Um, but again, these are the stories that you don't, don't hear of. But I sort of, the harder story was, you know, we're going on our 10th year. Uh, we actually uh, hit our 10-year anniversary next month. And what you don't see is actually a lot of the ups and downs, and more importantly, the downs. I think there's a lot of, you know, confirmation bias in the press in terms of like, oh, every company should get a Series A, that's a $5 million fundraise, that's a $25 million post-valuation. And that, I think, is a very atypical case, right? I think the reality is it's a lot of grinding, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of stuff that people don't talk about in terms of how difficult it is. How many times do you just want to kind of crawl up and cry in terms of like how hard you've worked and 
where you want the business to be, and it's just not there. So, it, so what you're saying is you can be a unicorn and not be sexy to an investor in the very beginning. Oh my gosh, right? And, well, I think that's absolutely true. And no offense to any potential VCs in the room, right? But I mean, a lot of them are operational or not operational, right? Uh, it's a lot of business school. It's a lot of uh, pattern recognition. Again, nothing against business school. But that is sort of like, I, it was funny, I remember, you know, until we got our first term sheet, we had like zero term sheet, right? But once we got our first how term far, sheet. How far into your company were you at that point? Well, so going back to the story, I mean, we started in 07, launched in 08. If you guys remember 08, 09, that was not a Those good time period. Those were great years for financial. Yeah, right? Like we were literally on the heels of Lehman going under and we were running out of money and we needed our Series A. That's pretty challenging, now, right? You now, can imagine. Now, when you say running out of money, you are already living on ramen salaries, and running out of money means your hosting account, you know, the $100 bill was not being paid. Uh, that's basically right. So we were, so I actually didn't even take a salary for the first three years uh, of, of, of Credit Karma's history. So, you know, we'd raised, I think all in maybe like $400,000, and that got us through uh, five, six people for the first I'd say two and a half years or so, two, two and a half years. So you and guys were really lean. We were really lean, um, you know, and, and it was, well, partly no salaries, you know, we were out of a very small space. Um, we actually tried to monetize a little bit in the beginning, right? We actually yeah. thought about monetization because we knew we had to go and pay the bills. But long and short of it is we started in 07, launched in 08, felt pretty good about the business. We had some users, we had some advertisers, and we felt like we were on a pretty good growth trajectory, but then you know, the unplanned happens, which is, you know, the biggest recession in our lifetime. And with, you know, Lehman going out of business, with basically every bank, you know, potentially also going out of business, it made fundraising a little bit challenging, right? Yeah. So I remember effectively pitching, it's hard to think of a, a, a VC that I have not pitched up and down Sand Hill over the last, you know, so 10 a lot years. of no's. A lot of no's, right? And like hundreds of no's. Yeah, so. a lot of no's, pat you on the butt on the way out, great job, great presentation, and not to be heard from again, right? Yeah. And um, that was hard. And, you know, I remember what we kind of continued to think about as well, let's just get through it. And, and I always think about the job as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, is just maximize your at-bats. Like, just don't go out of business. Because I have this philosophy that really centered around if everyone's bright and everyone's hardworking, you will ultimately figure it out, right? And then the job of the CEO is to make sure you don't strike out. You'll eventually hit the ball, assuming that you're a decent hitter to bring that analogy forward. Uh, so you'll continue to work hard and you have the right people who will eventually figure it out. You just gotta make sure you have that opportunity to figure it out. So, so what are, uh, speaking about that opportunity to figure out, what are so many entrepreneurs, you know, even in this room, missing? that you guys luckily figured it out? So maybe one of the better learning experiences for me, so I'm a little old in the sense that I was around for the first dot-com experience. And I'll, I'll share a story that um, I think still lives with me today, which was uh, first job out of school, I worked for a credit card company. Not all that sexy, but I actually went to my first startup uh, two years after my credit card company was purchased. And I remember I got to this company, it's now defunct, it's called Fair Market. I got there probably about two months before the IPO. And I remember the excitement, how much fun it was. Some of my best friends are still from that time period. But I think the more notable piece was how poorly the company executed and sort of the lack of fundamentals. And, and my story on that was, um, you know, we were in one of these traditional, uh, I would say, sort of like um, office parks. And, you know, you'd go outside of your space so that you could take the elevators or the stairs up to the second floor where you'd enter back your space because you had more than two floors. And I remember back then, we didn't like the idea that you'd actually have to leave your space, go upstairs, and come back into your space, right? So we built a $2 million stairwell so we could connect the inner spaces, right? And this is a company that was doing about $4 million a year of revenue, right? So we spent $2 million. Seems very economical. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You but we saved a lot of faster. time walking up and down. Imagine how much more efficient we'd be, right? Yeah. So the, really the point here was like, you know, it's easy to lose sight of fundamentals of a business and what it means to be a business, right? And I, and I think that certainly 2000 was that time. I think we can also get a little bit caught up in that in Silicon Valley, right? 
you see the snaps and the Ubers of the world and you read TechCrunch and you think about at the end of the day, oh, like, that's a pretty easy pattern to follow, right? I'm going to have a, a quick MVP. It's going to get some traction. I'm going to get funded. I'll spend a lot of money. I'll get my Series B. I'll go public in, you know, two and a half years, three years, and I'll be, you know, a multimillionaire. Like, that does not work 99.99% of the time. I think what you don't see is the grinding of what it means to go in day in and day out and have the conviction around the product and really putting in like your best foot forward. And again, maintaining the at-bats, right? Giving yourself and the company the opportunity to succeed. And that's the hardest part. And it's not always clear. It's not always, uh, uh, you know, sort of the things that people recognize in pattern recognition is that, oh, that's what it means to be an entrepreneur. That's what it means to be successful. And that's the untold story. And I think that's the one that um, I think for everyone in this room is like, be mindful of that. Don't follow the sort of the, the false example of how easy it could be. Think about how hard it is and then appreciate it and live in the moment. I think that's sort of the best part of the experience that I've had over the years. So tell me about a hard point in your life or in the company's <laughs> life together. Tell me about a time when you just wasn't going to work out. There was no tomorrow. Jeez, oh, well, uh, there's, there's a couple of those, right? I mean, there's probably four. You guys, we're talking about a multi-billion dollar company. When, when was the last time? Like, how long ago was it? That's been a while, right? That yeah. was probably six, seven years ago now, okay. right? So it, it's, it, it's hard to break the inertia. Once you break the inertia, it becomes a little bit easier. But at least on three occasions, we missed pay payroll. <laughs> yeah. uh, on one of those occasions, I wrote a check that was like the last of my money. Another one of those occasions, I got my mom to write a check, which was the last of the money. Um, and I think in one case, we probably just missed it. And uh, we, you know, we scrimped and saved and did everything we, we, we could do. And that's the reality of being an entrepreneur, right? And I guess on any of those points, if we failed, you know, I might not be on stage today and Credit Karma might not um, you know, have made it. Uh, but that, that's okay, right? And I think you guys realize, like, one, you should, that's normal. And I'd say try to embrace it and sort of make the most of every opportunity. So be thoughtful on the fundamentals of the business, right? I mean, it's really easy to, to throw the ex extravagant parties. I mean, we were in this, like, terrible 2,000-square-foot loft space for a long time. I literally sat outside the bathroom that everyone hated to walk by because I'm like, and I hated people going in the bathroom, but, like, that was the experience of what uh, I think the startup world was. And sometimes I look around and I think about all these incubator spots and how great they are. I'm like, God, that would have been awesome if we had it. But, uh, you know, it can be really hard. But I think it's also a lot of fun if you appreciate it and you take it for experience. And I've always found that, you know, prior experiences are things that will sort of build you up for the next one. I mean, uh, so going back to fair market, um, I certainly took away a lot of what it meant to be in uh, a startup, it certainly took away what it meant to be f focused on the fundamentals of a business. Um, I appreciated what it meant to be like hardworking in a place that didn't feel like work, right? And all of those experiences, uh, I, I think in many ways, shaped how I operate a credit card, how I thought about building the next business. So, you know, I, I think that some people in this room might feel like, oh, if I start a business and I don't hit the valuations or I don't meet a particular goal and I failed and I need to go and stop doing what I, I, I'm doing. And I think that's, that's sort of the furthest from the case, right? I think if you take your experiences, that will make you a better entrepreneur, right? I'd rather hire someone who's gone through that, who knows what it means to fail. Uh, failure is fine. I mean, we talk about this all the time at Credit Card. Like, Failure is completely fine if you've learned something from it. Like that data point and what you learn is value. That is success. And I think the experience of starting your own company, fun, understanding fundraising, like even how to do accounting, those can be all really powerful experiences. So don't judge your entrepreneurship on the company that you started um, on whether or not you sold for some dollar amount or whether you were able to raise money. Take the experience for what it is, and I think that's the most valuable part of being an entrepreneur. Yeah, so, so going back to kind of the beginning days, uh, what were you doing to create value with your customers? So Why did they stick with you? Why did they pay you money? They didn't. And Actually, they I don't, don't even know. How yeah, do you, how you, say do you make money? Uh, so, no. so, well, let me, let me talk. I oh, mean, really? going back to this idea of solving real consumer problems. So, 
just to paint the landscape. So 2007, uh, we started the product or started the company. And in 2007, the idea of a free credit score really didn't exist, right? Everyone positioned their, their, their site as a free credit score site. But the reality is, if you didn't put in a credit card, you couldn't get your score. And if you put in your credit card, if you didn't cancel uh, that subscription that you just enrolled in, you would uh, you'd be charged you know, either 10 bucks or 30 bucks a month, sort of, until you remembered. So when we started, it was pretty challenging. Sounds like a good business until you remember. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? I mean, they were making you know, really money hand over fist. And we thought, well, there's got to be a better way. There's a consumer problem here and that credit information is pretty powerful. But let's sort of pull credit karma out of it. Um, what, we, what we sort of recognized and the challenge with credit karma was that, um, one, people expected us to be not legitimate. And two, people expected us to spam them if we were legitimate, right? And you know, for us, the way to overcome that was very much about two ways. One, when it came to sort of legitimacy of the site, like we could only demonstrate it, we could only live it. So we spent a lot of time with bloggers, we spent a lot of time just saying, we don't even accept credit cards, right? We wanted to break the paradigm. So I would say whatever industry you're in and whatever paradigm or mold you're trying to break, how do you become the opposite, the antithesis of that particular thing? So essentially, thing? you were building trust with this. That, that's like, right. You can trust us. We're not doing anything with your information. We're not selling it. We're not collecting your credit card. We're not going to charge you. That's right. So that was the free aspect. I think the other piece was people then expected us to either spam them or sell their information, right? And um, so then we basically overcompensated for that. I remember you know, having a lot of conversations with the team, like, if we just sent more emails, we could get more monetization, which would keep the company going, or we could get more engagement, which would drive some of the metrics to get the fundraising. Uh, but I had pretty strong conviction that, hey, that's what you do um, if you're nearsighted, right? If you're really building a company, a brand to, to last for you know, 50, 100 years, you don't do those things, right? They, they're easy. And sometimes, you know, you want to do the easy thing, but I think the greater payout, the, better, the bigger reward is yeah. doing the harder things of the things that you shouldn't do. And it's hard to recognize in the moment, right? It's very easy to send the emails because you think if you send the emails, you'll be able to make payroll in three months. Uh, but that is a little nearsighted, and you have to be able to understand what that balance is as an entrepreneur. So how can these entrepreneurs learn from what you had to go through and that experience to creating one lasting value for their customers but two, like longer-term relationships with their customers. Well, I think it really it really matters. What is your objective? What problem are you solving? And what does success mean? And again, I don't think success ever means a valuation or a sale or a fundraise. Success means a problem for me. It means a problem that you're solving, a solution. And I think then you have to have a time horizon around that, right? Are you thinking about this for five years? Or are you thinking about this for ten years? Are you thinking about this for a hundred years? So for us, credit karma is very much about how do we change the consumer landscape, right? Nobody really understands how their finances works. Uh, no one, you know, the, the banks are okay, but they're sort of profit-oriented. How do we change the paradigm? And we thought that was going to be a decades, decades type of, of journey. So we built it for a long time. So no matter what you do, like what does success mean in that world? And what's the time frame of success? And then think about, well, if that's the time frame, um, does that mean you are quarterly oriented, annually oriented, or maybe decade oriented? And you go from there. So, you know, going on that for the entrepreneurs, again, in the room, um, what's one mistake you see a lot of people in this audience making? Uh, you know, there's, well, so many mistakes that I've made. I'm trying to think of one that's sort of the most relevant for, for everyone. Uh, I put him on the spot. Yeah. You know, I think it's that jaded idea that um, what, what success is traditionally defined as, right? I mean, I remember going home a lot of times after what I thought was an incredibly great venture fundraising meeting and just like feeling, you know, like on top of the world and literally, you know, a week later, not a single response from the emails I've been going on. Yeah. And I guess sort of the learning there was... Um, that's pretty normal, right? And what it does is, like, if you think that the term sheet is, like, normal, then you're going to be always disappointed. You're always going to be like, hey, <laughs> I'm not doing very well as an entrepreneur, right? And I wish more people, and why, part of the reason why I'm here telling that story is the normal is, 
you know, 95% of the time you're going to get no's. I'd say probably 99% of the time you're going to get no. And if you're fixated the other way, you think like, oh, only 1% of the time am I going to get no. You're always going to be disappointed. And I think that is discouragement. And that's the other piece is just conviction. I mean, a lot of people don't realize how much conviction you need to be successful. You have to be able to pick yourself up day in and day out, right? Whether that's from a product perspective, a fundraising perspective, that's the reality. So I encourage everyone, have a ton of conviction, believe in the product, believe in what you're doing, and don't think, take your successes and, or take your failures and turn them into successes. It's not e obvious, it's an easy sort of statement, but you know, from my perspective, I've learned something at every company that I've ever been at, either whether I was, you know, uh, ultimately laid off at fair market when we went under, uh, I learned a ton there, or whether it was, you know, like understanding the importance of credit at the credit card company that I work with. There's always something to take away. That's the success that you should focus on. Ken Lin, everybody. Thanks, Thanks man. Thanks, man.